Our psalm says today, you will show us the path of life. Our psalm says today, you will show us the path of life. But it's not always that easy, is it? Wouldn't it be great if the path of life was like one of the runways in Hartsfield? And it was all lit up and showed you right where you were supposed to go? That's not how the world works, though. That's not how life works. And so we, from time to time, both as a parish and as a diocese and as a church and as a greater church of all Christians, have to sit and reflect on what it is that the path of life shows us. We had an opportunity to do that this week in the Diocese of Atlanta for our 109th Diocesan Council held just down the road at the Gwinnett Center. Fred Ski, our senior warden, and I got a chance to hang out with each other and about 500 other Episcopalians um, talking about all manner of high-minded things, but mostly spent a good bit of time talking about the path of life. Specifically, a purpose statement for the Diocese of Atlanta. And for those of y'all who are not familiar with the Diocese of Atlanta, it is basically 110 churches and missions headquartered at the Cathedral of St. Philip's where the bishop sits, but goes all the way from south of Macon near Warner Robins to the Tennessee border and all the way over to South Carolina. It's a huge geographic area. And to get representatives from each of those churches and missions in one really big room was very impressive. We spent a lot of time debating, though, the purpose of the diocese. After 109 years, I think it's important to note that even an organization that's as stable as the Diocese of Atlanta needs to take time to figure out exactly what it's doing. Because after all, right now see I've walked myself into a trap. As a pastor and, uh, and non-math guy, what's 109 minus uh, off of uh, 2015? We were founded in 1854, is that right? Anyway, no. 1906, thank you. Thank you. 1906. 1854, I get that. We'll take it. Time flies. But 106 years ago, we had a much different purpose, didn't we? There was to spread the gospel all throughout the regions of North and Middle Georgia that did not have churches, that did not have parish, parishes, that had not heard the word of God uniquely in the Anglican manner. Now, 109 years later, we have a much different challenge, a much different world to live in, where things like the internet govern so much of the way we communicate with folks. And for those of y'all who are wondering what this contraption is in the middle of our aisle, that's a baptismal font made of... Um, what do you call it, uh, driftwood from Lake Lanier, and a bowl that was handcrafted by one of our parishioners, and uh, gear that was bought from Best Buy, uh, so that every sermon is recorded and put on our website, so that we can spread the word of God, of not just to folks who come to St. Gabriel's, but to whoever can figure out how to use the internet. And there are a whole lot of people who have figured that out. So at the end of this raucous debate, we came up with a purpose statement that it turns out was really the same as the one that the committee had proposed, and which Bishop Rob Wright said specifically he had not contributed a word to. So I think that gives it some validity as both um, not from the top down and as a grassroots statement of our purpose. And I think helps us figure out not just the meaning of the gospel message today, but to try and get some sense of where the events of this week have put us. The purpose statement, because I, I have to apologize, I have yet to commit it to memory, Fred. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, even though man, I heard it a hundred times while they were debating yesterday. The purpose statement, and listen to these words closely because each one was uh, contested. We challenge ourselves and the world to love like Jesus. Let's just stop there. That's pretty cool, isn't it? As we worship joyfully. And y'all know that's a big thing for me because I think way too many Episcopal churches don't worship joyfully. As we worship joyfully, serve compassionately, and grow spiritually. We challenge ourselves and the world to love like Jesus. As we worship joyfully, serve compassionately, and grow spiritually. That is the purpose statement that was adopted yesterday by the Diocesan Council. So, pretty high-minded thoughts. What do we do then with that purpose statement in light of the gospel, where Jesus warns us, nation will be brought against nation, kingdom will be brought against kingdom, and these are just the birth pangs of the kingdom to come. 
That's a pretty violent image, isn't it? It's a pretty daunting picture that Jesus paints for his apostles. And notice he doesn't tell the whole crowd this in our gospel lesson today. He focuses just on his core group of leaders to say, guys, it's going to get ugly before it gets pretty. It's going to get really ugly. But is that any surprise? Isn't that, after all, what life is like? When you go to a soccer stadium to enjoy a concert and the people around you are blown to bits, it's easy to forget how difficult life is. And it's easy to forget that in these moments of strife and conflict where we struggle to figure out why is it that these things happen, it's easy to forget that it may be part of the plan after all. Every Christian has learned how to pray based on the gospel. It was this core group of leaders who said, Father, teach us how to pray. And how did Jesus respond? You can say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, we'll spend a separate sermon on what uh, God being our Father and what it means for us to be here and Him in heaven, what that's all about. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Again, a whole separate sermon on Yahweh and what the hallowed name is. Right Now we're in the third line of the Lord's Prayer, everybody. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We're in the third line of the Lord's Prayer, and we are theologically right here in the middle of our gospel lesson and right here in the middle of this terrible week. Thy kingdom come. When the apostles sit down on the Mount of Olives in our gospel lesson today and say, Jesus, you're talking about this mighty temple being brought low, totally destroyed. What does that mean? Is that a sign of things to come? And he says, yes. When I teach you how to pray and say, thy kingdom come, here's what that means. Nation will be brought against nation. Kingdom will be brought against kingdom. There will be wars and earthquakes and famine, and that's just the start of it. That's horrifying. And yet, in our Lord's Prayer, that's what we ask for right at the outset in the third line. Thy kingdom come. Now, for non-Christians, they say, well, you've got to be careful what you ask for, people. <laughs> Why on earth would you want that? And yet, in the epistle to the Hebrews today that we just heard, in the epistle to the Hebrews, we hear about why we want that. We hear about why we have to go through this strife. We have to go through this conflict. It's because we maintain in our hope the confession of our faith of a greater glory, that God's kingdom will come and we will have everlasting life. That's the hope for that great prize. Listen, when we do the Eucharistic prayer today and we get ready for communion and celebrate the body of Christ, that we all live together in him. It's that glorious heavenly country that we strive for. And that even in the darkest times, we have to remember, like in Paris this week, that it's not always going to be pretty. Bob, I spent a little bit of time looking at the Greek here because I always wonder when Jesus gives these violent images to us, where's the Jesus that puts a child on his knee and says the kingdom of heaven is like this? Because I want to try and understand where all this came from. The original Greek that the uh, apostle wrote this message in says, ethnos kai ethnos, nation and nation, ethnos and ethnos will fight. Basileia e Basileia, that's kingdom versus kingdom. And so I went back and looked in the, in the original Greek and sure enough, he means exactly what he says. If the original Greek is any indication, countries will fight, people will fight. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, otherwise known as the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, right? You may see in the news, ISIS or ISIL, right? Either way, that's a nation. And right now, they're fighting against France. If we have any wonder about whether that's the case, the French president told his people yesterday, we are at war. There are troops on the streets in Paris. Nice timing for those of you on the video. There's a helicopter flying overhead. <laughs> I'll assume it's a weather helicopter. 